Earlier this year, as they do every year, Open Doors releases their world watch list. And it chronicles Christian persecution around the world. And in that report, it specifically stated that one out of eight believers worldwide experiences a high level of persecution. Not just getting blasted on social media, not being trolled on social media, not being called a funny name to their face or an insulting name, but some extreme level of persecution. The loss of a job, family members shunning them, marginalizing them, being cast out of society, and even paying the ultimate price for their faith. This list of the top 50 countries where it's most dangerous uh, to follow Jesus, to, to be a follower of Christ, reflects that some 309 million Christians around the world live in a place of extreme persecution. And there's one country that actually topped the list as being the, the top country in which Christians are killed today. They're murdered for their faith. And that country might surprise you if you knew a little bit of its makeup. And that country is Nigeria, where some 46% of the population is said to be Christian, where there are some mega churches, like mega, 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 mega churches uh, in that particular country. They face extreme persecution from violent Islamic extremist groups who frequently destroy the property of believers, abduct women and children kill young Christian men, rape and sexually assault boys and girls and forced girls uh, into forced marriage. Extreme persecution. And Open Doors estimates that three out of the four martyrs in the world today, let's say three out of four Christians who are killed every day for their faith, are killed in Nigeria. Great levels of persecution happening there. In fact, it was so baffling that earlier this year, the Biden administration removed Nigeria from their watch list of countries that uh, are egregiously violating religious freedom, a kind of giving a pass to those extremist groups who are torturing and murdering Christians today in the world, kind of signaling to them that their crimes of oppression uh, are going to go unpunished. But we know, because we've been looking at this for a number of weeks now, that persecution of the church is is nothing new. It's happened from the beginning. In fact, God's people have always been opposed and persecuted. We we can go all the way back to the beginning and see that. But specifically in the era uh, of the church post the ascension of Jesus Christ, we see the church of Jesus Christ oppressed. Facing the hostility uh, of the world, the anger of the world that is opposed to God, opposed to the, the gospel of Jesus Christ and who hates the people of God. Revelation is addressed to churches that are witnessing for Jesus in the world while facing that particular oppression. That's the seven churches there in Asia Minor. Now. We currently enjoy more religious liberties than, and freedoms than our brothers and sisters do around the world. Uh, so I want us to, just on the front end, be encouraged to continue to pray for them. To, to sympathize with the plight of our brothers and sisters around the world. We are a family of believers and where one hurts, we all hurt. Where one grieves, we all grieve. Where one weeps, we also weep with them. We must not forget that. Because today we get to enjoy this time together uh, as a gathering of God's people without fear uh, of, of someone coming through that door and telling us to stop the worship of Jesus. But while we think about that, I also want us to be prepared in heart and mind and in our faith to face what's coming in the days of head. The days of intensifying persecution of the church that's going to move from what we experience now, what we see in our world now in terms of uh, religion here and our faith here in the West to intensifying levels of persecution that are going to come and we must be ready for that. We must be prepared. We must be prepared to talk about what we've been talking about that Our faithful witness of Jesus Christ will involve loss of some kind. The main point we're going to be teasing out today is simply this, that the faithful witnessing church 
will not only share in Christ's suffering and death. We've been talking about that. We're going to see it today again in God's word. Will not only share in Christ's suffering death, but also in his resurrection and exaltation. Let's turn our attention to the word of the Lord. Hear the words of the almighty God. And when they, this is speaking of the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. For three and a half days, some of the people of the tribes and languages and nations will gaze at their dead bodies And refuse to let them be placed in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them. And make merry and exchange presents. Because these two prophets had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days a breath of life God entered them. And they stood up on their feet. And great fear fell on those who saw them. Then they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them. Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies watched them. And at that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. These are the words of the Lord. I've been saying that this chapter can be divided into four scenes, four vignettes, if you will. We've already looked at two of them. The spiritual protection of the church that we saw there in verse 1 as the temple of God, as being measured in the temple of God. The people of God are spiritually protected from harm, though they're not exempt from persecution. They are the holy city that's going to be trampled for a measure of time, the great tribulation period, the, the age of the church, but she's protected from spiritual harm. We talked about the invincible proclamation of the church as the second scene. That God has granted the church a particular power, not only just to be spiritually protected, but a power in the proclamation of the gospel where she will accomplish her mission. To be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ, proclaiming the good news around the whole world until the end of time. Now we're going to look at those last two scenes here. The first that we're going to see is what we've read about there, the satanic persecution of the church. One thing should be glaringly obvious by now as we've been studying Revelation is that being a faithful witness has a cost. It will cost us something. Faithfully testifying of Christ means the loss of something. Yeah, it could be a relationship. Yes, it could be our job. It could be our reputation. It could be something we value greatly. But it will cost us something to faithfully proclaim the good news, a robust gospel that tells people not of just salvation in Jesus Christ and and how to escape hell, but of the judgment to come. We talked about that last week. Not only do we announce good news, but we do it in sackcloth like the two witnesses. It's mourning and lamentation and judgment. There's, There's bad news that accompanies the preaching of the good news and And people need to hear that. We know from scripture that here that he is the faithful witness, Jesus. And it's it's him that we emulate as faithful witnesses. His life and his death are, are the paradigms that we follow if we're to be faithful witnesses of Jesus. We know in Jesus' life, what did he do? He testified of the Father. He testified of the kingdom of God. He announced the gospel of the kingdom. But what also did he do? He suffered. He was persecuted. He faced hostility and he suffered. And he was faithful unto death. And that's our model for witness. Jesus Christ. And we see that expressed vividly throughout Revelation. Look at these chapters and what they talk about. In chapter 1, we see Jesus called by John the faithful witness in verse 4. And and we know that that John is exiled on Patmos on account of the word of God and his testimony of Jesus. In chapter 2, we find in Jesus' letter to one of the churches there, he refers to Antipas, who was martyred for his faith, and Jesus calls him a faithful witness. 
In chapter 3, in Jesus' greeting to the church in Laodicea, he refers to himself again as the faithful witness, faithful and true witness. In chapter 6, the opening of the fifth seal, we see the souls under the martyr and of the, of the martyrs under the altar. And why are they there? They're there on account of the word of God and for the witness they had born. In chapter 12, we're going to see the dragon. I'm not going to explain that now, but you see the dragon making war on those who hold the testimony to the, to the testimony of Jesus. In chapter 17, the harlot is said to be drunk with the blood of the saints, the martyrs for Jesus. In chapter 20, we see John seeing the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony of Jesus. You can't miss this recurring pattern in Revelation. Witness and suffering. The saints witness, the saints suffer. The saints witness, the saints suffer. The saints witness, the saints suffer following the pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ, the true and faithful witness. It's not hard to see how the Greek word for witness has become the standard term that we use to refer to those who pay the ultimate price for their faith. In the Greek, the word witness that we've been reading is the Greek word martus, from where we get the Greek word martyr, but it means witness. But somewhere along the line here, it, it, it became the term for those, synonymous with the term for those who are faithful witnesses of Jesus, who engage in the task of witnesses, and now are paying the consequences of their faithful witness in death. It became known as martyrs. It's not hard to see that from what we see in the scripture. A witness and being a witness for Jesus inevitably means that there will be a loss of some kind, even up to and including death for those who are his faithful witnesses. Let's look at the church here in verse 7, because it strikes the note of what we addressed last week, the invincibility of the church as a faithful witness. In verse 7, and when they have finished their witness. Now, we spent a lot of time last week looking at the two witnesses. So I'm not going to cover all that ground. But I, I disappointed some of you by revealing it is not Moses and Elijah come back from the dead for an encore presentation to do signs and wonders. It is a symbol for the church of Jesus Christ and her role as a witness for Jesus. And I gave Tons of explanation example. What that is, please listen to last week's message. But it says when the two witnesses, the church has finished their testimony. The church has a commission that lasts, we're told here, for 1260 days. A symbolic number for the, the church age, the tribulation period. From the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ to his second coming. It's the same length of time as the 42 months in which, in verse 2, we saw the holy city will be trampled by unbelievers, meaning the church throughout her entire duration in which she is being a faithful witness for Jesus, she will face relentless persecution, opposition, and even martyrdom. It's that period of time there of divine commissioning. But despite all of the opposition that the church will face, she will succeed. Look, at this when she finishes her testimony. Her testimony is not interrupted. She's not stopped somehow in the middle of her testimony. When she finishes her task, when the mission is accomplished, she will succeed. But isn't that what Jesus said? He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against her. Jesus will build his church. He will accomplish the building of his church through the faithful proclamation of his people in the world. Though she's opposed, she will succeed. And that's why the church has endured in the, in the darkest times of, of history. Through the fiercest of, uh, of persecution and opposition. She's still here. Like the church is still here. Even when we just read about this intense persecution around the world, the church is still growing and marching forward. And the kingdom of God is advancing because Jesus is building his church. Nothing can stop that forward progress. The great commission, according to verse 7 here, will have a great fulfillment. The church will finish her mission. Now when that time is complete... 
we know we're approaching the end. And at that point, it's going to appear as if the church is fully conquered, overcome, and killed. Well, when does that happen? Well, when the goal of the church is reached. It says here this beast will rise up from the bottomless pit. And we looked at the, this rising up from the bottomless pit uh, in, in, in previous uh, sermons here. Right? This is the abyss. But before we get into who the beast is, all right, I, I want to remind us of something. That what comes next here, and what we read about what happens to the church, it is something that is appointed by God. It, it's, it's an event, it is a series of circumstances where the, the church will face apparent defeat, but it is something that is on God's timetable. It's something that God from before, from before time existed, he already put in pen in his calendar at an appointed time. It is scheduled. The church will finish her witness, will finish her time of testimony, and then this will happen. It's a reminder again that the beast, whoever this is, right, whoever this the darkness is here, the spiritual forces of darkness are still all under the authority and sovereign rule and control of the God of the universe. Nothing is happening here outside of that. So I just want to remind us of all of that. And this will happen at some appointed time at the end of history prior to the return of the Lord. And I know that because of what Jesus said in Matthew twenty four fourteen. He said this gospel, and he's sharing with his disciples, here's what's going to happen at the end times. You guys want to know? He says this, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations, and then the end will come. Notice what he said there. It will be preached. Not might be, I hope you guys live up to the challenge, like this gospel is supposed to go into all the world. I hope you do it. And then he said, it will be preached, and then the end will come. It's at an appointed time. This is not a mystery to God. He's not just seeing how human events play out and, and how good the church does in her role of witness to go, okay, you know what, I think it's time to come back. I've, I've heard such foolish, foolish sermons that, that we hasten the day of the Lord means that what we can do is speed up the timetable of the Lord. Then you're not speeding up the timetable of the Lord. You're not God. There's a point of time. And when it happens, it's going to be a good time, right? It's going to be a dark time, but it's going to be a good time here. The end will come. That's what he's expressing in this vision here. When they have finished their testimony. It's exactly, again, when we look back at uh, chapter 6, right? At the opening of the fifth seal. The the souls of the martyrs are under the altar. And their their, their plea is, Lord, when will you avenge us? When will you judge those who killed us? When will you avenge our blood? And the Lord says to them, rest a little longer until what? He says it like this, until the number of your fellow servants and brothers should be complete. There's a specific time for that to happen. And then the martyrs will be vindicated. And when that time of consummation comes, it's, it's the end. And John is seeing this in his vision as, as something that has commenced. Remember, we are in an interlude here between the sixth and seventh trumpets. It's telling us something about the role of the church now in the world as it is facing uh, judgment from God for its opposition to God, its, its hostility towards God's people. Well, this beast emerges from the bottomless pit. Now, we're going we're gonna to study the beast in chapter 13, all right? So we're not going to do a full-length study in that, but it's the first time that the beast is mentioned in Revelation. This, this person, this individual, this thing, whatever it is, hasn't appeared anywhere. And he just says, hey, the beast emerges from the bottom. What, what does that tell me? It tells me that John assumes that his readers understand who he's referring to. He doesn't need to interpret the symbol here, this imagery. He assumes his readers already know who he's referring to. He said, well, how, how would they know that if it's the first time the beast shows up here? It's not a surprise. Where is it found? The Old Testament. Scriptures that God's people would already have known, specifically from Daniel, which we'll look at here 
uh, in a moment. John says that the beast will make war on the two witnesses. He's not only going to make war, he's actually going to win, or seemingly win. He's going to conquer them and even kill them. They're going to be destroyed somehow. It's the total annihilation of the church is what's being referred to in this, in this vision that John is seeing here. Is a parallel to this vision. Remember, these are parallel cyclical visions. So we're going to see it in verse 17 of chapter 12 as the dragon making war with the offspring of the woman who we're told are those who hold to the testimony of Jesus. The same thing we're going to see in verse 7, this beast that's allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. That's intense persecution that's going to lead to the destruction of the church that doesn't sound like some rapture before the tribulation, does it? Some secret rapture where the church escapes and evades this trouble at the end. No, no, the church, it's going to appear like she's defeated. She's conquered. She's done for. She's been ended. An attempt to wipe the church off the face of the earth. Now, just because it says the beast emerges at this time doesn't mean that that is when the beast emerges. We're going to see that the that the beast has been at war with the people of God throughout the history of the church. And even now, the powers of darkness, the powers of this beast are arrayed against the church, trying to destroy her. But this is like the culmination of this epic war between the wicked world and the witnessing church of Jesus Christ. And at this particular final time of intensification of persecution, it will appear as if the church has lost the war. She will seem obliterated. Now, let's see where this imagery of the beast is drawn from. It comes from Daniel's vision of the four beasts. You might be familiar with that. We don't have time right now to go into it. We will when we get to chapter 13. But John, Daniel receives this particular vision of how human events are going to unfold from his time through the end of time. Right? When the Messiah establishes his eternal kingdom. And, and in that vision he sees four beasts. And those beasts represent evil kings and kingdoms which persecute the saints of God. Now John want, Daniel wants to know rather who... who who the beasts are. He wants the interpretation of that, but specifically the interpretation of the fourth beast because there's something so distinct about that one. There's something very different about the fourth beast. So he wants the explanation of that. But look at these two portions of Daniel chapter 7, 21 and 22. It says, As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them until the Ancient of Days came. And judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom. And then in verse 25, he says this, He shall speak words against the Most High. Now, we're going to explain all that in in chapter 13, but I just want you to see this now. He shall speak words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and shall think to change the times and the law, and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. Those three verses that we see there, Okay, we're representative of God's people in Daniel's time. There's a specific fulfillment of it there, but it is also a prophetic future forward look at what was to come in Messiah's kingdom. The end times, the latter days, which Daniel saw in the future, and John has already told us right here at the beginning of Revelation, Revelation has now been inaugurated. These are the end times. These are the latter days. These are the last days. This is about the witnessing church. The beast makes war on the saints, wears out the saints for a time, times, and half a time, which, again, we've already looked at last week. 1,260 days is 42 months. It's the same period of time. And the beast, in Daniel's vision, prevails over God's people. He conquers the people of God until the Ancient of Days comes and the saints possess the kingdom. When is that? At the coming of the Lord. His second coming. At the end of history. That's what Daniel sees in this vision. So who is this 
particular beast. Let me give you a simple explanation. The beast is any and all world powers that oppress and persecute the people of God. It may be a king. It may be a head of state, an evil dictator. G.K. Beale, in his uh, commentary in Revelation, describes the beast as the system of spiritual evil standing behind the nations and manifesting itself in successive world empires. The system of spiritual evil standing behind the nations and manifesting itself in successive world empires. That's the beast. Any nation that opposes God and his people and persecutes the people of God is the beast. We see that in Daniel's vision, which we, we, we'll, we'll go over in detail in chapter 13. We see it here now. What is the beast doing? Making war with the saint, the saints, opposing the saints, opposing the people of God. So what seems likely here in this vision that, that John is seeing of the faithful witnessing church and what's going to happen that time prior to the return of the Lord is the, is at the end of the age is the witnessing church where the hostility of the world, the unbelieving world who's opposed to God and his people, worlds, nations, people who are, who are governed by these spiritual forces of darkness behind the scenes, perhaps the final antichrist figure will be given a time to bring about the seeming annihilation of the church here on earth. That might be what's in view here. That's going to happen at this time towards the end of the witness, the witnessing period of the church and prior to the return of the Lord. Seems to be what Paul is writing about in 2 Thessalonians. When he's talking about the coming of the Lord and he refers to this man of lawlessness that will be revealed prior to the return of the Lord. Maybe. Maybe. We're going to talk about the Antichrist in future sermons. So what we see in Revelations chapter 20 verse 7. This the end of the millennium. The church age. Where Satan is, who had been bound is said to be loosed for a period of time. And during that time what is he going to do? He's going to gather the unbelieving kings and nations of the world. To make war against Christ. It's the same period of time. It's all pointing to the same thing. This time right before the return of the Lord, where it will appear as if the church has been dealt a death stroke. Now we have in this passage this imagery of the slain bodies of the saints of God just kind of left on the street, littering the streets, being gawked at, and and, and, and this refusal to bury the bodies. What does that mean? Well, in ancient, in ancient times, it would have been a shameful indignity to not bury a body. To leave a dead body exposed out in the street would be uh, just displaying just such shame and indignity towards that particular uh, individual. There's a, there's a mockery uh, that the world is engaging here at the death of the church. Their bodies, it says here, lie on the streets of the great city which is symbolically called Sodom and Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Now, it's interesting, John's telling us symbolically. So their bodies are not in Sodom, their bodies are not in Egypt, or the city where the Lord was crucified, but symbolically called these particular three cities. As you read through Revelation, every time this term, this phrase, great city, is used, it only means one thing. It's referring to Babylon. It's referring to the great city, Babylon. You'll see that in Revelation 16, Revelation 17, and in chapter 18. It was Babylon. Well, Babylon was the wicked empire that was there during the time of, of Daniel's visions. Okay? And, and, and they captured the people of God. They took them into captivity. And then it refers to where the Lord was crucified, right? That's Jerusalem, right? Isn't that where the Lord was crucified? What's he, what does he mean by that? Well, here, Jerusalem is likened to Babylon. Why? Remember what he says. These cities are symbolically called Sodom, Egypt, and Jerusalem. But why Jerusalem? Well, Jerusalem typifies and designates the city that did what? Rejected the Lord. Rejected 
Christ as Messiah. What does Sodom and Egypt typify? These cities represent evil and ungodliness and wickedness, the oppression of God's people, enslaving God's people, right? Extreme levels of wickedness and depravity, the worst kinds of depravity would be linked to to Sodom. That's what this great city, Babylon, is likened to. One commentator said that Babylon is no city and it is every city. Every city that is, that is opposed to God, opposed to the holy city that we looked at in verse 2, the church, is Babylon. All of them. Now, what the time of the writing here, Revelation, the great city was also the one in which the churches uh, lived in and inhabited, right? The Roman Empire. That was the great city. That was Babylon who opposed the people of God. Well, so was Jerusalem because it rejected the Messiah, and rejected the people of God. But it's any great city that does that. Beijing, it could be New York, it could be San Francisco, it could be Paris, it could be London, it could be Tokyo, it could be Istanbul, it could be any city, any nation that opposes and persecutes the people of God. And what we see in this passage here, this contrasting between two cities, the holy city and the great city. And all of humanity can be characterized and and categorized, rather, in one of those two cities. You are either of the holy city of God, or if you're of the great city, Babylon. That's it. It's one or the other. And the only thing that distinguishes your citizenship, whether you belong to the holy city or you belong to the great city, is your relationship to Jesus Christ. The Lamb of God who was slain for our sin and our salvation. Those who reject Him are of the great city, Babylon. And those who have received Him, live for Him, and are His faithful witnesses are of the holy city of God. What we see here is that this world ruled by the beast will think at this time, at the end of the church age, that they have finally gotten rid of the church. Look at the imagery that John wants to evoke there. The church is dead. Their bodies are strewn in the streets. And what are the inhabitants of the world doing? They're filled with joy and delight. They are celebrating the death of the church. They are rejoicing that the blood of the saints has been spilt and that the church is no more. They've thrown a party for the death of the church. Why are they doing that? Seems so morbid, doesn't it? To to rejoice in the death of the saints of God. Well, verse 10 tells us they're going to rejoice because these two witnesses had been a torment to those who dwell on the earth. The prophetic witness of the church is seen as a torment to the unbelieving world and by the unbelieving world. Now, that's not just something unique to that period of time, is it? It's what we experience today in our proclamation of the gospel and our prophetic witness and testifying of Jesus Christ, right? It is perceived as torment. And the unbelieving world would love nothing more than for the church to be wiped off the face of the earth, completely exterminated. People hate the light. People love the darkness and their sin. They don't want their their wicked deeds exposed. And we talked about the judgment last week that's pronounced when the gospel is preached. And when it's opposed and rejected, right, that's, that's what we're engaging in. You and I are agents to, to bring about this kind of judgment through the, our proclamation of the good news. The world hates that. The world doesn't want their wicked deeds brought to the light. There's no neutrality where the gospel is concerned. Either someone will receive the good news and turn and look to Christ for salvation, or they will reject the good news and reject Jesus Christ and be appointed to judgment. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral ground in that whatsoever, and you need to banish that thought from your mind. So I said last week, if your ultimate goal is is to be as sensitive as possible and how you preach the gospel so that no one is offended, it is not the gospel that you will be preaching. 
Certainly not the gospel of Jesus Christ. To some it will be life. And to some it will be the stench of death and torment and of judgment. That's no neutrality. The world may pat the church on the back for her good deeds. The church may receive the keys to a city because of their social programs and and their work for the poor and their work to help the homeless. But the moment the church steps into her prophetic role, the moment the church steps into her, her role of gospel proclamation, she will draw the ire and anger and hostility of the unbelieving world. There is no neutrality. There just isn't. And we have forgotten that. And we like to be stroked by the world. We, we like to be told how all, all that you guys are so amazing what you're doing in our city and our community in helping the poor and the marginalized. Great. That is the good works, the good fruit of the gospel at work in our communities. But that is not all we are called to do, brothers and sisters. We are called to proclaim this message that judgment is coming. The seventh trumpet is about to sound. Repent and turn to Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. That's the prophetic message we've been given. The witnessing role of the church. And some will respond and some will hate us for it. It's the way it is. One pastor I heard recently said, if the world feels comfortable with the gospel you proclaim, watch out. Watch out. May not be the gospel that you are proclaiming. As religious liberties are are eroded, even here in Western countries like ours, we're still going to see persecution intensify. I mean, I think we're seeing it with these cyclical visions. There's an intensification. You're going to see it with the bold judgments here soon. Right? There's an intensification of that. Look here, here in our own country. Right? We have lawmakers who want to ban the prophetic preaching and teaching of the church. And call it hate speech. Especially in areas of biblical teaching on marriage and sexuality. Right, That's hate speech. You can't tell someone that what they're doing is sinful. That's hate speech. We've got pastors being arrested in Canada right now for doing that. Pastors in the UK being arrested for preaching on biblical sexual ethics. Straight out of the Bible. It's hate speech. You're going to see it happen. Just just this past week. I mean, look at the vile, disgusting displays of those who are out there protesting in front of the Supreme Court. Salivating over the chance to murder an unborn child. Rejoicing that they could do that and that they want to do. What is that? What is that? While God's people were there and many were there, right? To to proclaim, you know, that all life is made in the image of God. And that we need to protect even the most vulnerable and weakest among us. Like the unborn in their mother's womb. The world hates that. The world doesn't want to be exposed for as wicked as it is. The world doesn't mind the good works of the church, but the world minds the good news of the church. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. The world wants nothing more than for the church to suffer the same fate as her Savior. To be killed. To be killed. That's what we've been called to. Not a wonderful Advent sermon. (laughs) That's what we've been called to. For faithful witnesses, this is what we've been called to. The world forgets something very important though, right? Where there is a death, there's also a resurrection. There's also a resurrection. Look, look what happens here next. Because, because this elation, this joy, this celebration, this party that's being thrown at the death of the church, of the witnessing church, is short-lived. It says that the bodies are there in the streets for three and a half days. Not three and a half years. Three and a half days. That's a much shorter period of time. Three and a half days is a broken seven, an interrupted seven here. It's an incomplete period. The triumph of the beast and the earth dwellers is going to be cut short. Right? It's just like 
Again, the paradigm of Christ's suffering. The church is going to look like the lamb, slain, dead, killed, right? But in that paradigm of Christ's suffering, what is there also? The subsequent exaltation of Christ. And now for us, the subsequent exaltation of the church that emulates the paradigm of Christ. And just like his death was interrupted, the church's apparent death will be interrupted. She will be raised up just like Jesus and will ascend just like Jesus. Now, the language here is so phenomenal and it's straight out of Ezekiel's vision. You, you might remember the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. I encourage you to go read it. Uh, what an amazing vision that is. It speaks of of Israel, the people of God there, but it is also a prophetic picture of, of all believers in all time in history. But you see that in Ezekiel 37, 5, this, the language is taken from there, where <clears throat> in the prophetic uh, word there is that I will cause breath to enter you, and then in 37, 10, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet. It's the same language there, because that's what it's looking back to. The church is going to receive her inestimable prize, vindication, resurrection, and glorification, right? There's going to be a physical resurrection that is signifying the spiritual resurrection that has already taken place in the people of God. First, the spiritual resurrection in Christ, we are made alive, and then the physical resurrection here at the end of the church age. Now, I said earlier that it does not appear that there is a rapture of the church before the tribulation so that somehow the church is exempt from all of these things that happen in the end of the age. But that does not mean that I don't believe there is going to be a rapture because I see one here quite clearly. This is speaking of the rapture of the church. I don't see it any other way here. This is the rapture of the church at the end of the age. The voice says, come up here. And what happens then? says they went up to heaven in a cloud. That seems to indicate a rapture of the saints of God, but not a secret rapture. It's a rapture that happens in full view of the world. Despite the view that people are just people are going to just disappear and nobody knows what happens to them and their clothes is neatly folded. All we know is planes have crashed and cars have, have crashed and people have disappeared from everywhere. This is happening in full view of the world. Everyone gets to see it. The saints are going to be caught up with the Lord. And I know that because of their response. Great fear fell on those who saw them. It was seen. It was visible. The church raised up to receive her prize where she's fully vindicated by the Lord in the sight of those who thought they had permanently destroyed her. And I think this accords with Paul's teaching of, of the coming of the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. Right? This is the trumpet judgments. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. It's a visible rapture of the church. It's going to happen. There is going to be a rapture. It's just that the church isn't going to avoid the fierce and intense persecution where she will be seemingly annihilated. But God is vindicating his people. They will receive their reward. They will be raised up. And there's the parallels between the saints and the Savior, right? He ascended to heaven in a cloud, did he not? Acts chapter 1. What are the saints of God doing now? Ascending in a cloud to be with the Lord. Their ascension is observed by everyone, and it's going to be witnessed by all. Isn't that awesome? I had just, that just blows my mind, just even thinking about that. Where the world's going to be like, yeah, finally, we got rid of them. We can do whatever we want. No one's going to judge us. And then, you know, dead bodies rising up to be with the Lord in the air. That's crazy to me. And while a lot of scholars think this is just all symbolic here, no, I, I think this accords with the other teachings we see in Scripture, especially with Paul, uh, of what he's talking about here, that we are going to experience a physical resurrection this way. And here, it's telling us it's going to be witnessed by all. Now, I'd like to, I'd like to close out looking at 
the seventh trumpet, all right? Uh, and, and we're going to move pretty briskly through this in the time that we have left here. But I, I want you to see how this chapter closes out and these trumpet judgments close out because this brings us to the end of this particular cycle of symbolic visions. In verse 13, uh, it says that at the very hour in which the church is vindicated, there's going to be an outpouring of judgment. It says a great earthquake, a tenth of the city fell, 7,000 were killed in the earthquake. Now, that is, again, symbolic figurative language here, right? A tenth, 7,000, right? But is, is this referring to the final judgment itself? Well, verse 14 tells us that the second woe has passed. If you recalled, after the fourth trumpet, there was this, this appearance of something like an eagle that was in the heavens saying, woe, 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 right, at the sounding of the coming trumpets, right? There was three more trumpets to come, three woes. We've already looked at two, and it's telling us here the second woe has passed. This interlude is between the sixth and the seventh. So the third woe uh, is coming, according to this. So I see this here, because of that, as the beginning of final judgment. Because a tenth here, right, is a tithe. It's a percentage of the whole, but it's not the whole. And 7,000 is an illusion, and all Bible scholars are pretty much in agreement, is an illusion back to the 7,000 who, uh, at the time of Elijah, who had not bowed the knee to, to Baal. So this is speaking of a remnant of people, right? A remnant, not the whole, not a majority, just a remnant. But it, this is like an ironic reversal here. Because I, I think as I, I look at this and what, what's happening in this particular section here, this remnant represents a, a portent of what is to come. Not the full and final judgment, but a foretaste of it, right? Like great unbelieving humanity is going to get a sampling, a taste of first fruits of final judgment after the church is vindicated and raised to receive her reward. I don't know how long it is. I think it's a very short period of time. Again, it was three and a half days at the church of their apparent defeat before they were taking, taken up. This extreme judgment comes. How long it is, I don't know. We, we're not given an indication of what all of that is. But the judgment results in that those who are not killed are then going to be terrified. And it says that many then will give God glory. Now, I don't believe that means that they repent. I don't believe that means... I, I'm not saying that some may repent right, and be saved at time. I'm not saying that it's not. But the language here doesn't say that they had the fear of the Lord. It says they're terrified, okay? They were frightened. They were fearful of their lives. And giving them glory, and, and, and we can look at other places that's used in Revelation, is more about a recognition of God's power, of God's sovereignty, uh, of his holiness, right? So there's this recognition of the reality of God and his power because the judgments have begun. Now, the event immediately following the church receiving her prize is the seventh trumpet sounds. It's the third woe. You might recall, again, in the interlude uh, right before this of the two witnesses, it was the angel and the little scroll. And in that vision, the angel representing Christ makes a declaration in uh, chapter 10, uh, rather, I'm sorry, not in chapter 10 here, uh, in chapter, yeah, 10, 7, where he says this, that there would be no more delay, but that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. There'd be no more delay, right? When that seventh trumpet sound, it's on, like it's, it's happening. And that's what we see happening here in verse 15. Let me read from the scripture. Revelation eleven fifteen. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Like, so with this final trumpet blast, the kingdom of Christ is, is made fully manifest to the world. It's not a secret kingdom. It's not a hidden kingdom. It is made fully manifest. And John then now hears loud voices in heaven declaring that, and he hears and sees the 24 elders again fall on their faces and worship. Right? All of these heavenly scenes are punctuated with the worship of these heavenly creatures. 
And they say this, we give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Now, what they're doing, these 24 elders, is actually echoing Psalm 2. If you read Psalm 2 there, it starts like this in verse 1 and 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Like this psalm is now the backdrop for the heavenly worship that these 24 elders are engaged in speaking of the rule and reign of Messiah, the kingdom. The psalm continues They are by saying that the nations, they thought they were a match for the Lord. They thought they were a match for his anointed one, the Messiah. But God laughs at their delusion. God God laughs in, in derision at those who rebel against him. How foolish they are. How foolish for men and nations to set themselves against the Lord. So it says the Lord then enthrones his son, right, as king on Zion. And it's to him that the nations of the earth are granted as an inheritance. And he's going to rule the whole earth. He's going to possess the whole earth. And that psalm closes with a warning. A warning to kings. A warning to nations. right, To humble themselves and to submit themselves to the rule and reign of the son. It says, kiss the son. Kiss the son. Don't be foolish. Take refuge in him. The psalmist saw this as as the far-off future reign of Messiah and what was to come. But John is now seeing that this is now at hand at this seventh trumpet blast. This long-awaited, long-anticipated messianic kingdom prophesied in the Old Testament has finally come. Christ has defeated and vanquished every spiritual force of darkness that held the kingdoms of this world in their grip. He's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to reward his servants, the prophets and the saints. We will receive our prize. All the faithful witnesses of Christ. Full deliverance. Full vindication. And we will reign with Christ forever. It's amazing. It's amazing. In Revelation, this chapter closes the way it begins. With the victory of God's people reflected by this temple imagery. In verse 1 we saw it as, uh, as this. John says I was given a measuring rod like a staff. And I was told rise and measure the temple of God. And the altar and those who worship there. That is everyone who is counted in. Who is part of the people of God. The saints of the living God. Those who are in Christ Jesus. And the chapter closes then. This vision closes with another vision of God's temple. In verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. Flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. I'll close with these three reminders for us, as we can see there. First, this reminder that we are God's temple. We are secure in Christ Jesus. We are spiritually protected. Whatever satanic persecution comes against the church, however every demonic force arrays herself against the church of Jesus Christ, she cannot be harmed, we cannot be harmed, until we complete our mission. Don't forget that. This is confidence to go in the world. It doesn't matter what happens to us physically. It doesn't matter the loss that we experience of some kind for our faithful witness of Jesus Christ. We are spiritually protected. We have been measured in the temple. Secondly, we're going to receive everything that has been promised us. We're going to be vindicated and we're going to receive our eternal reward. We see that in what what it says here about the temple of God. It says his temple in heaven is opened and the ark is visible. Now, you know, in the tabernacle, where was the ark? The ark was hidden, wasn't it? The ark was behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. The temple wasn't opened. Or everybody could see what was going on and see straight through to the ark. No, no. Here it's telling us the ark is visible. 
What's, what's happening here at the end of the age is that everything is going to be in full view of all of creation. Right? We're going to see the beauty of Christ in a way that we have never seen. We're going to understand the purposes of God like we do not. We don't comprehend and understand them now, but now, then it'll be fully visible to us, fully manifest to us. It's going to make sense. We will have a clarity about God's purposes, about what we went through in this life, and we don't understand it in the here and now. We don't get the suffering here and now. We don't comprehend why we have to go through the things that we go through now, or why the world hates God the way it does. But then the temple's open, the ark is seen, everything will be disclosed. That's awesome. It's awesome. We will know. I I believe we're going to know. A lot of people say, well, you won't care when you get there. Well, this tells me I'm going to know. It's going to be visible. It's not going to be hidden to us anymore. Right now, things are veiled to us because we can't see clearly. We see dimly. But then, but then, Christ is not veiled at all. We will see him in all of his beauty and glory and supremacy. My God, how amazing that is. This is the only time the ark is mentioned in Revelation. Like we've had this temple imagery and all that, but now it says the ark of the covenant, right? The ark of the covenant was what? The ark was where the tablets, right, of the law that God gave Moses were placed. Those tablets there were, were there representative of the, of the standard of God's holy law, the standard of righteousness, And how the people of God had broken the law. Hence all of the sacrifices that had to be made. The blood to be shed to make atonement for the transgression of God's law. But the ark was also, if you recall, a symbol of the victory of God's people. That ark was carried upon the the, the shoulders of the priests as they marched before Joshua and the people of God. As they went about Jericho. Right before God gave them the victory and the promise Uh, Of entering into the land that he had given them. That ark is representative of Christ. It's Christ Jesus. It's the throne of God. And it's Christ who's gone before his people. It's Christ who's made atonement for his people. It's Christ who has kept the law of God perfectly. He kept the covenant of God. Not one of the promises of God are going to be broken. Because Jesus is our ark. And God's people are victorious. Christ has secured that. He's guaranteed that for us. What confidence we have, brothers and sisters. This is why this book is so important for us to grasp and know. But thirdly, that last phrase there, there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, earthquake, and heavy hail. Those are all symbols of judgment. Specifically at that time, final judgment. While the people of God will rejoice on that day and worship God. It's going to be a terrible day for those who've rejected Christ. That symbol of the ark which is life to us who know and follow Jesus. Will be a symbol of wrath to those who reject him. It's a symbol of every broken command. It's a symbol of a life of disobedience and rejection of God. On the last day, everything will be fully and finally revealed. Think about how horrifying it will be on that day that some will, will finally realize that what God has been doing through Christ is real. There are going to be those on that day that will see the saints rise to their heavenly reward. And they will realize that they have no part in that. And they'll have no part in that because of their stubborn refusal to be part of Christ's kingdom and live under his gracious rule. What a terrifying day that will be. Don't miss that. Be a part of that by making sure you have turned to Christ in salvation. That you look to Jesus who fully obeyed the, the law of God perfectly in our place. And died for our sins whose blood was shed. So that our sins would be forgiven. 
so that we would be assured to be in this place and not be like those seeing the church rise to their reward and recognize that it is too late. The seventh trumpet blast will be too late. It will be too late. Brothers and sisters, we have a mission that we've been called to. Preach the gospel. Proclaim the gospel. Let nothing hinder that. You're spiritually protected. Know that we'll face persecution. Embrace the loss that they, that might bring, whatever that might be, for being a faithful witness of Christ. And be fully convinced that on that day, you will be raised up to receive your reward as a faithful witness for Jesus Christ. Let's get to the mission, brothers and sisters. Let's get to the task at hand. We've seen here the whole trajectory and career of the church in this beautiful chapter. Now let's do our part by engaging in the mission of Christ. Amen.